I'm glad we can start, and I um, apologize for the delay. Um, but as many of you who come regularly, you, you already know that we tend to start late, gives people a chance to get in. Um, I first came to the Emirates in 1982, uh, and my friend and, and distinguished guest, Herb Wolfson, first came in 1992. So I should know more about the Emirates, but in fact, I left and didn't come back for 25 years, where as he came in 1992 and, and never really left, as I will explain. Uh, Herb Wolfson, who I've been trying to get here for, well, for, for quite a long time, and I'm glad he's here today, um, finally, is an American lawyer who has dedicated most of his career to the United Arab Emirates since first becoming resident in Abu Dhabi in March 1992. He, he is admitted to practice law in Pennsylvania and holds a legal consultancy license in the United Arab Emirates. He splits his time between Philadelphia in the US and the United in the UAE. Over the years, uh, Herb Wolfson has advised clients in a broad range of transactions in the UAE and neighboring countries. He has also advised clients in the education sector, including leading American universities and K-12 education providers. Herb Wolfson has worked closely with local advocates in Abu Dhabi and Dubai on a number of litigation matters and thus has a deep familiarity with the local court system and procedures. He has published numerous articles and, free, and frequently lectures on UAE laws as well as international legal issues and is considered a leading expert on the laws of Abu Dhabi and the UAE and uh, AV systems. <laughs> Mr. Wilson sits as an arbitrator and also represents clients as counsel in arbitration proceedings in the UAE and elsewhere. He is a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators and is on the list of arbitrators at the Dubai International Arbitration Center and the Cairo Regional Center for International Commercial Arbitration. Herb, as I like to call him, frequently teaches courses on legal topics for lawyers and non-lawyers. He has taught in the UAE, Qatar, Oman, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and Japan. Herb led a seminar on independent power projects for the Afghanistan Ministry of Commerce in Kabul in 2004 and spoke at conferences in New York, Washington, San Francisco, Paris, Beijing, Kuala Lumpur, and Do Doha, among others. He is often retained to provide expert testimony in US courts on Middle Eastern laws and legal systems. Uh, Herb Wolfson graduated with high honors from the University of Pennsylvania Law School in May 1998, 1988, excuse me, and also holds a master's degree and a bachelor of arts degree in Arabic language and Islamic legal history from the same university. And if you're wondering, he, he does speak fluent Arabic. Ah. So please Thanks. join me in welcoming Herb Wolfson. Thank you very much, Joe. Thank you. I didn't need your title. Hmm? I didn't need your title. That's OK. Uh, no problem. Well, good evening, everybody, um, and thanks for inviting me here. I want to thank NYU Abu Dhabi for asking me to speak tonight uh, about the nature of the law in the UAE. And I'd also like to thank all of you, the audience, for turning out to attend a lecture on what seems to be probably an arcane legal topic. Is the United Arab Emirates a civil law jurisdiction? Whatever that means. And we'll talk a little bit later about what that might mean. Um, I have to uh, thank a friend of mine, an Emirati attorney, uh, for inspiring me to think about this question. He posed it a couple of years ago um, as I was delivering a lecture in a different university setting. It was over at Paris Sorbonne, uh, and I was talking about an even more arcane topic, the impact of the French law doctrine of imprévision on long-term contracts in the United Arab Emirates. If that is not guaranteed to put you to sleep, I don't know what will. Um, but um, it's early evening, not late evening. And hopefully, um, we'll keep you awake through this uh, in time to reach the coffee at the reception afterwards. Um, anyway, during that uh, panel discussion, this gentleman asked why lawyers and scholars seem to think and assume that the UAE is a civil law jurisdiction. And I thought that was a very thought-provoking question, and I've been thinking about it for a while. So before we can really 
analyze that question and, and, and try to answer what the UAE is, we have to first ask ourselves, what does it mean to be a civil law jurisdiction? So we have to start by defining what we're talking about. What we're really talking about is where to put the UAE sort of in the spectrum of legal systems in the world. Do we, how do we classify it? Is the UAE a purely Sharia-based system? Is it a legal system that has more in common with legal systems like France or legal systems like England? Or is it something else, some sort of a complex hybrid? And in order to do that, in order to analyze that question, we really need to define some of the terms we're talking about. So first, what do we mean when we're talking about a legal system? A legal system is more than just a law or a group of laws. A legal system is both a structure and a methodology for doing lots of different things, including, for example, deciding which conduct is permissible and prohibited, informing people about what the law is, and resolving disputes. So in trying to do all these things, different legal systems may approach it in different ways. So when we're looking at a legal system, we want to ask, um, are we starting from a general legal principle and then using it to deduce specific rules and outcomes? Or are we going to take individual decisions on specific cases between people and use inductive reasoning to extrapolate general principles of law from there? So in other words, are we working from the top down or are we working from the bottom up? And in either approach, how do we let people know what the law is? Do we, um, how do we ensure that people know what's prohibited and permitted? Do we gather everything into a book or in a database and everybody can access? Or do we have a system where you need specialized training and learned scholars to sort of ascertain what the law is and be sort of the intermediaries that tell people what is prohibited and what, and what is permitted? So um, these are different approaches that different legal systems can use. When we're talking about resolving disputes, different legal systems approach it differently. Are we placing more emphasis on consistency and uniformity so that we want every case that has similar facts and similar legal issues to have a similar outcome? Or do we want to give judges the flexibility to use reasoning to decide things on a case-by-case -case basis so they can emphasize uh, concepts like justice and fairness as they see it to uh, reach an outcome that's desirable to them in that case. Or a third option, do we want to emphasize taking the rules, whatever they may be, and faithfully and accurately applying them, even if that sometimes leads to outcomes that are inconsistent in specific cases, or outcomes that may, in some cases, seem to be unfair and unjust. And all three of those have advantages and disadvantages. It's not like one is the right way to do it and the others are the wrong way to do it. And different systems have different methodologies methodologies to, um, to get at that. So having defined what a legal system is about, what are some of the different legal systems that exist around the world? A lot of lawyers talk about it as if there's only two, as if there's a dichotomy between civil law systems and common law systems. And in a moment or two, <laughs> I'll try and define what we mean by civil law and common law. But there's lots of other legal systems in the world. There's Islamic law, the Sharia. There's canon law, which is the legal system of the Roman Catholic Church. There's Roman Dutch law, um, and so on and so forth. And all of these legal systems overlap in some ways, both in terms of their historical roots, their methodologies, and their objectives. And because of that overlap, it's not always very useful or helpful to draw sharp distinctions between them. But people love to classify things. They love to put things in little boxes and draw distinctions. And that's why we get to give <laughs> academic lectures about what category something goes into. Um, so we often hear, so we're going to try to do that here. And we often hear that the UAE is a civil law country. So we'll try to analyze whether that whether we agree with that and, and you know, what the trends might be uh, in the UAE in the coming years. 
Well, so that means I have to talk about what the civil law tradition is. And to do that, I also need to talk about what the civil law tradition isn't. And that means we have to talk a little bit about common law and about Islamic law. And then we can look at the UAE and maybe gain some insight in where it goes, which category it goes into, and again, as I said, what the coming trends might be. Well, no speech in 2017, no presentation is ever complete without slides, and this is no exception. And my first slide lists some different legal systems in the world, and I got to use little flag emoji icons to graphically illustrate um, some, but not all, of the countries associated with um, a particular legal system. So you can see that for the civil law tradition here, I have little flags of um, France and Spain and Germany and Japan and Mexico and Egypt and Lebanon. That list is um, both incomplete and oversimplified. It's incomplete, obviously, because I don't have space on the slide to put a flag for every single civil law country in the world. Um, and it's oversimplified because, after all, all of these legal systems in each country are different. And Germany's legal system has different historical roots than France's legal system, for example. But we're not here to have a history lesson so much as to talk about the UAE, and I am hoping to get to the UAE before midnight, so um, we're not going to talk about every country in the world. Um, the slide also has flag icons from several common law countries. We've got the UK, the United States, Canada, India, Pakistan, and Singapore. Um, again, that is obviously an incomplete list, but it's also inaccurate. Technically speaking, the flag icon should not be the UK. It should be a separate flag for England and Wales and a different flag somewhere else on the slide for Scotland. But my um, Mac OS doesn't have an England flag, a Wales flag, and a Scotland flag, so um, I couldn't do it that way. Um, you also see, as I said, US, Canada, India, Pakistan, and Singapore. Um, for the Sharia category, I put a Saudi flag icon. For Roman Dutch, um, just because I like to brag that I've heard of Roman Dutch law and I know a little bit about what it is, I put South Africa, Sri Lanka, and Guyana, which are three countries that follow the Roman Dutch tradition. For canon law, I've got a Vatican flag. This is also inaccurate because canon law is the law of the church, not the Vatican city state. But hey, how often do you get to display a Vatican flag anywhere? So I took the opportunity to do that. Um, and for the hybrid civil law common law category, I put a flag of the Philippines for reasons that I will explain later. OK, civil law is a shorthand term that describes law which is based on codes and statutes, or more generally, a legal system that is based on codified law that is gathered together somewhere in a book or collection of books, or maybe nowadays in an online database. Um, civil law is generally understood to mean a top-down system where you have legal rules enacted by a sovereign which are expressed through provisions or articles of statutory law and compiled into reference books. Um, for example, a civil code, a commercial code, a company's law, something like that. For our purposes tonight, when we're distinguishing civil law systems from other systems, it doesn't really matter who that sovereign is. It doesn't matter whether the laws and codes are enacted by parliament somewhere, uh, a council of uh, deputies, or whether they're enacted, promulgated by a king or an emperor, it doesn't really matter. What matters is that one or more human beings enacted those laws and then gathered them together into a reference book. And I think uh, Napoleon, who is credited with really commissioning the French Civil Code and then spreading that all over the world, his idea was we want the law to be accessible to the people so that anybody who can read can open up the French Civil Code and know what the law is. We don't need to go through the intermediary of specially trained learned men to tell people what the law is. We can go um, 
to, uh, directly to the book. And I think that idea is very much in keeping with other trends that were happening in Napoleon's time as, um, as you had the idea that even in Christianity you had more of a move away from priests and directly interacting with the Bible. Um, so that is one of the things that you see in a civil law system. So the role of the human beings in enacting the law is one of the important things that will distinguish a civil law system from, say, canon law or sharia, where the principles of law are coming from God. They're coming from human beings in a civil law system, but it is a top-down system. And we see that contrast in um, the next slide where you have in the Sharia system, the principles of law are coming from God, and then you have the revelation in the Quran. Some legal principles will be expressly stated there, but not all. So then you need legal scholars using the science of fiqh to ascertain legal rules from the acceptable sources of law. And that is both the Quran, the Sunnah, which is the um, sayings and deeds of the Prophet Muhammad. But Sharia-based system also has a role for custom and practice, al-'urf al-'adha. And custom and practice of the people, especially in commercial law, in commercial cases, this is a very important aspect of Islamic law. And so therefore, Islamic law, unlike civil law, also has a ground up or bottom up component, component as the things people actually do in their commercial life forms custom and practice. And that then sort of moves in an upward direction and legal scholars can use their tools of fiqh to uh, derive legal rules out of that. So um, while Sharia is sort of the ultimate top-down system because you've got your rules coming from God, it does have a little bit of this um, ground-up component. Now, all of this is oversimplification. I'm not trained in Sharia law, so certainly if I've gotten anything wrong here, if I've made any error in my characterization, please feel free to correct me during the Q&A or afterwards um, uh, if you want to talk to me. Um, Courts are important in a civil law system because they decide cases. They, dis they decide and resolve disputes between people. People always have disputes, whether in business, whether in personal life and other matters, there's always disputes. But court decisions in a civil law system are, in theory at least, not in and of themselves important to people, people who aren't parties to the specific case, to non-litigants in that case. Because in the civil law system, there is no system of binding precedent. What do we mean by binding precedent? That's something that we'll get to in a minute or two. We'll talk about it when we move to the common law system. But, but um, in a civil law system, the court decision is relevant to the parties of that case, not so much to outsiders. What is the prime example of a civil law legal system? France. France is usually considered to be the exemplar of the civil law uh, methodology. France exported its legal system and ideas all over the world through colonization and through conquest. So we see civil law systems operating in one form or another in the countries that Napoleon conquered in the late 18th and early 19th centuries, with some really key examples being Spain, Italy, and Egypt, and in the territories that France and Spain colonized. So you have French-speaking Africa, Mexico, which was colonized by Spain, the Philippines, much of the Spanish-speaking world, the province of Quebec in Canada, and even the state of Louisiana in the United States. All of those areas got some variation or some form of the civil code originally commissioned by Napoleon and, um, and, and, and exported uh, in that period of time. Egypt, in turn, 
then went and exported its legal system throughout the Arab world. So the Egyptian system, which is incorporating much of the French tradition, got exported to the United Arab Emirates and lots of other Arabic-speaking countries. Doesn't that mean that the UAE is by definition a civil law country? Because UAE modeled its legal system on Egypt. Egypt in turn modeled it on France. Well, I think that's exactly what underlies the assumption among lots of people. And you see this especially among non-Emirati Arabic speaking lawyers in this country that the UAE must be a civil law country because it's just like Egypt or just like Jordan or just like Lebanon or just like wherever that expat Arab lawyer happened to come from. But things aren't that simple. The UAE system isn't just like Egypt and it isn't just like Jordan or any of those countries. And when you say that it is, you overlook much of the beauty and complexity of the UAE system. This is a small country. And it's a young country, but it has a really complex um, legal culture, and it is dynamic and growing. And I'm going to turn now to what I think is one of the third influences on the UAE system, which is common law. Common law countries have legal systems inspired by England. And what we see is, just like France, most of the French and Spanish colonies adopted civil law. Most of the countries that were colonized by the United Kingdom um, became common law jurisdictions. So that gives us the United States, most of Canada, Australia, Ireland, India, Pakistan, most of English speaking Africa. I say most because South Africa is a special case. They have Roman Dutch law. A common law legal system, in theory, again, is using inductive reasoning to take general principles of law out of decisions in specific cases. So courts decide a case, and that case, from that case, we extract a legal rule, and we take a whole series of cases, and hey presto, we now have um, contract law, or property law, or tort law, or whatever that um, uh, law might be. The common law system is based, at least in theory, largely on what we call case law, decisions by judges that are considered to serve as binding precedent. And the very term case law that we use illustrates the importance that court decisions play in the common law jurisprudence. So here, where we looked at civil law being top-down, sharia being largely top-down, common law is bottom-up. We start with people's specific cases, they bring them to court, the court resolves the dispute, we extract general principles from prior court decisions, and then those principles become the common law. Now one of the problems with this system, of course, is it, it, it means that you need to have a little bit of specialized training to know how to extract the principles out of the case law. Okay. So um, that means we need to talk about binding precedent. Well, precedent, what does it mean? It means a prior decision by a court in a case that involves similar facts or issues. It means that other courts are bound by this decision. This, we're not talking about the simple effect of the case binding the parties. When you go to court and the judge orders you pay 1,000 dirhams to uh, so-and-so, you're bound by that, you're obligated, right? But only you are obligated by that. In, in all court systems, we have this concept, it's called in Latin, res judicata, and in Arabic, hajiyat al-amr al And this tells us that the parties themselves are obligated, um, they can't reopen the case later, they're bound by it. Okay, but we're talking about something a little bit different because in the common law system, your court decision can have an impact that's far beyond the original parties. There's two paths for binding effect. Top down, Supreme Court decision will articulate a legal rule. It means lower courts like a court of appeal or a district court, a court of first instance, has to follow the rule articulated by the higher court. So if the United States Supreme Court issues a ruling that states a principle of law, 
all the lower courts in the United States have to apply that principle in future cases that involve similar facts and circumstances. If you have a ruling issued at a lower level, let's say a court of appeal, everything under that court of appeals circuit has to follow that. But a court in a different circuit doesn't have to follow it. And that court in the different circuit, we may say that ruling, they can look to it for persuasive authority, but it's not necessarily binding on them. Well, that's the top-down effect of binding precedent in a common law system. But there's also, in addition to that vertical path, there's a horizontal path, which is what we call the doctrine of stare decisis. And that means that if the court today issues a ruling on an issue of law, a future court is supposed to apply the same rule if they're faced with similar facts and issues. And the policy behind that is, gee, similar facts deserve similar outcomes. It's fair because it's consistent. So um, that's the principle. So here you see it's a horizontal path. A future court is going to be bound by what a prior court did. Now, there are obviously some exceptions to that, but that, that is the general rule in, um, in the common law system. If you have to overturn that or break with precedent, usually you have to have a very, very compelling reason to do so. So that is one of the big differences. There's also some differences in courtroom practice that we see between civil law systems and common law systems. In the civil law, lawyers are going to, and, and we see this in the Arabic language courts in the UAE, lawyers will file written submissions on behalf of their clients, but the judge handles the case. The judge is really in control of the full case. So for example, the judge has the power to frame the legal issues in the dispute. It doesn't really matter it, what the lawyers say is the legal issue. The judge can reframe it or recharacterize the legal issues. The judge is the one in a civil law trial. In, it, uh, the judge is the one who questions the witnesses. The lawyers don't directly talk to the witness. The judge asks the questions. And if there's any specialized expertise that's needed, it's the judge who decides to appoint an expert. And it's the judge who tells that expert what his mandate is, what is the task that he's being given. In the common law system, in contrast, it's very different. You, the, the trial is driven by the adversary relationship between the parties and their lawyers. So in a common law court, the parties, through their lawyers, frame the issues. The party says what they're suing for. The party raises a defense or raises a claim, and if they don't raise something, the court normally won't consider the issue. If you didn't raise it, the court doesn't need to think about it. That's a major difference in the common law system. Also, the lawyers are the one who question the witnesses directly, and there's a whole art of direct examination and cross-examination and all of that. Um, it's very different in a civil law case. And then if specialized expertise is required, each party is free to present testimony from an expert witness he selects. And that's why I get lucky sometimes, because when the case in the US courts is about UAE law, sometimes they call me to give that expert witness testimony about what UAE law is. And I'm always very happy to do that. Um, well, like many dichotomies, things are never that simple. Common law systems aren't purely ground up. Civil law systems aren't purely top down. And then you have hybrid systems in some places like the Philippines, like the province of Quebec in Canada, and the territory of Puerto Rico in the United States. And in due course, I'm going to submit to you that the United Arab Emirates is one of those hybrid systems. And that the interesting question for the next few years is whether we're going to see that hybrid lead to more convergence, more divergence, or some kind of synthesis as UAE law really brings all of these elements together. So obviously common law systems are purely ground up. 
derived entirely on case law because in the United States, in the UK, in Canada, you have lots and lots of statutory law that gets enacted by Congress or Parliament or um, whichever the legislative body is. Um, the United States Code, for example, is tens of thousands of pages of federal laws classified by subject matter. The Code of Federal Regulations is, last time I checked, about 200,000 pages or more of regulations. Statutes and regulations play a huge role in the UK and in other common law countries as well. And what does a common law court do when faced with a issue that is contained in a statute or regulation, the common law court has to do exactly what its civil law counterpart has to do. It has to use deductive reasoning to take what that law says and apply uh, that law to the facts of the case. And binding precedent isn't always binding. Sometimes we see the Supreme Court of the United States go back and overturn or break with one of its key precedents. And sometimes that's very controversial. Um, other times it's very much applauded. So, um, you know, we had back in the 1950s, the case Brown versus Board of Education, which was a major case in the civil rights movement that basically prohibited segregation of public schools. That case broke with an earlier precedent that was set some years early in Plessy versus Ferguson. And the Supreme Court said, well, look, Plessy versus Ferguson was just wrongly decided. It was just wrong. And um, we're not going to uphold it. So that's in the common law. It's not as pure as I made it out to be in the first few slides. At the same time, in civil law countries like France and Egypt, the role of judicial precedent is sometimes underestimated. Um, a ruling by the highest court in one of those countries, the Mahkamat al naqd the French Cour de Cassation, Dubai Mahkamat al tamiz that doesn't formally obligate a lower court judge to rule the same way in a future case involving similar facts and similar issues. But the practical reality is that judges are human beings they don't like their decisions to get reversed by the higher court. If your decision is reversed, it implies that you made a mistake in your legal reasoning or somewhere in your ruling. You made an error. And if you make too many, if you have lots of reversals, it means you made lots of errors. And lots of errors means maybe you're not going to get promoted. So. Uh, a judge is going to be careful about trying to limit his opportunity or likelihood of getting reversed. So he's going to probably be studying the precedence of the Court of Cassation to try and ascertain trends. And if he sees a trend that the Court of Cassation is consistently ruling in a certain way, he's going to shape his ruling around that. He may not be formally obligated, but informally he views himself as sort of bound by what the higher courts are doing. Um, so you find, even in Egypt, even in the UAE, in the Arabic language courts, and in other civil law jurisdictions, you see lawyers looking at what the high court is doing and using that in their submissions. And you see judges citing to those higher court decisions in their judgments. Then you have hybrid countries. And here's where I'm going to come to the Philippines and Puerto Rico. Um, both of them were under colonial rule by Spain for something like 300 plus years. And during that period, both of them inherited codified civil law systems from Spain. But both territories got acquired by the United States after the Spanish-American War in 1898. And the US administration introduced common law institutions into both places, including American-style courts. Puerto Rico continues to be a US territory, albeit today without any power and electricity. But Puerto Rico 
is integrated into the American court and legal system. So a system of binding precedent and court practices from the common law tradition are there. They're overlaying an infrastructure that's based on sort of codified law that was inherited from Spain, but all the common law methodologies and institutions are there. In the Philippines, although the Philippines gained full independence in 1947, and it has a civil code, which, by the way, if you look at it in structure and even in some of the wording, it's remarkably similar to its cousins in the Arab world. Um, Philippine courts still use the system of binding precedent and even sometimes still look to judgments of the U.S. Supreme Court as persuasive authority. So you see there it's kind of a hybrid jurisdiction. Quebec. Quebec was originally colonized by France later acquired by the British. Quebec is also firmly rooted in the civil law tradition. Everything is done in French, but it's still an integral part of Canada. And so because of that overlap, there's a strong influence of some of the common law institutions and methodologies. Well, what about the UAE? Um, I, I think the UAE is a hybrid system that because of its unique history and environment combines elements from at least three legal systems in the world, Islamic law, civil law, and common law. So let's look a little bit at the history and environmental influences here, and then we're going to turn to what I think is the more interesting question of where things are going. So first, Sharia. Islam is obviously a fundamental part of the religion and the religious and cultural heritage in the UAE. But Beyond that, the Constitution of the United Arab Emirates expressly states a role for Islamic law. And um, where is it? It's here. Article 7 of the UAE Constitution, which says that Sharia is a principal source for legislation or for legislating in the Federation, however you want to translate it. Um, you also have express references to Islamic law in the Civil Code, in the Penal Code, and lots and lots of other laws in the UAE. Um, and I think one of the interesting references is in the Civil Code itself. Article 1, the first article of the Civil Code in the UAE, gives instructions to judges on how and when to apply Sharia. And it basically tells judges, and here I've got it in Arabic and I've got it in English. Um, it, it tells judges um, that they are supposed to, they are required to decide cases according to the provisions of the civil code when the civil code has a dispositive text, something that's on topic, something that's on point. They must use the civil code. If there isn't anything, if there's a gap in the civil code so that their question isn't answered by the positive law, the enacted law of the civil code, then they turn to Sharia. And then it gives them guidance on how to do that. Do you look at Maliki rules, Hanbali rules first, and then if nothing is there, then you look at Shafi'i and Hanafi after that. And if there's nothing that you find in Sharia sources, then you rule in accordance with custom. So there's this hierarchy of where to look. And so it's instructing the judge to look at the positive law, the enacted law text first. And if, it's, if there's a gap in it, then you turn to Sharia. But but Article 2 tells you you, can, you are supposed to use the rules and principles of fiqh, of Islamic jurisprudence, in the understanding, construction, and interpretation of the civil code text. So what does that mean? What, what that means is we have a system of positive law enacted by human legislators, but that system of positive law is vetted to ensure conformity with Islamic law values and principles. And it's overlaid on top of a system in which the Sharia principles are sort of the bedrock infrastructure. It's rooted in Sharia. 
It's, so Islamic law becomes the reference point that you consult whenever there's a gap in the positive law that's enacted through the legislative process. So that at a minimum, therefore, you have a hybrid of two systems. You have a civil law system because you have positive law enacted by a legislature, but you also have this bedrock of Islamic law, which is the Sharia-based system. Second, we see that the system of enacted legislation in many of the institutions in the United Arab Emirates are heavily influenced by Egypt and other Arabic-speaking countries. There is a very close correlation between the civil code of the UAE and the civil code of Egypt. And it's a correlation that is so close that lawyers and judges in the UAE routinely consult Professor Sanhuri's commentary on the Egyptian civil code to help them understand and interpret the UAE civil code. And you see this 12 volume work, Al Wasit, in um, the offices of most lawyers and judges in the UAE. Um, this, um, in addition, you have courts, the Arabic language courts, the federal courts the Abu Dhabi Judicial Department, Mahakim Dubai, the Russell Khaimah courts, all of them are modeled on the structure of the Egyptian court system. The procedures used in the courts are modeled on procedures that are used in Egypt, which in turn are modeled on France. So we find in the UAE direct analogs to Egyptian institutions, such as the Niaba, the public prosecution, which corresponds to the French parquet général and the Mahkamah al naqd the Court of Cassation, which corresponds to the French Cour de Cassation. These are an analogous institutions. Well, does that mean that the UAE is, just like Egypt and France, a civil law system, albeit one with an Islamic law infrastructure? Or is the legal environment here in the UAE more complicated than that? And that brings us to the third point, which is the significant influence of common law on the United Arab Emirates. Some may think that the common law influences here began rather recently and are limited to the role of the large British and American law firms, some of whom are represented in the audience tonight, um, who are active maybe in the financial free zones like Abu Dhabi Global Market or Dubai International Financial Center. But common law ideas Practices and institutions are deeply embedded in the fabric of the UAE system, and they go back to the very early days of federation. And one example of this is the 1971 Dubai Law of Contract, which was a codification of the contract law of British India. The Dubai Law of Contract basically took common law principles, like the concept of consideration, and ported it into Dubai law. The current status of that law, I would say, is um, somewhat uh, unclear. Um, it's not really relied upon much, but it remained on the books for decades, including well after the UAE Federal Civil Code was adopted back in 1985. So you can see the common law influences have been around in the UAE from the very, very beginning. And I think an even bigger influence of the common law is the role of English-speaking lawyers and legal consultants working in the country. Although the constitutional text that I had up on the screen a little while ago says that Arabic is the official language of the UAE, and certainly we all know the government is operating in Arabic. However, we also know that English is the de facto language of business in this country. And for decades, English-speaking lawyers working in the UAE have been drafting contracts in English. And most of the time, those contracts are signed and performed without ever being translated into Arabic. The overwhelming majority of the expats who are drafting and reviewing those commercial contracts come from countries with common law backgrounds. And here, I don't want to talk about Britain and the United States or Australia and New Zealand. We're latecomers to the process. It's really India and Pakistan. India and Pakistan 
our colleagues from those countries have been here for decades before we got here. And they have been working, whether in um, ad hoc or in the banks, uh, in, 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 in various places, writing contracts. Many of the local litigation firms, even the smaller ones, would have Indian and Pakistani lawyers on staff that act almost as a bridge between their English-speaking client and the Emirati litigator and the litigation team. So what you have is decades worth of contracts that get written in English. And then sometimes disputes happen and those contracts need to be brought to the local courts by UAE lawyers. So what you have is common law concepts coming in. The courts are forced to deal with them. The contracts aren't being written usually by Egyptian lawyers and, and, and Emirati lawyers. They're being written by English-speaking lawyers. So you wind up with concepts from the common law that are getting into the court system, and the courts are forced to deal with them one way or another, and that always has an effect. Um, beyond contract drafting, what about contract interpretation? and dispute resolution. Here's where things, I think, get really interesting. Um, arbitration seems to now be one of the fastest growing forms of dispute resolution throughout the United Arab Emirates. And especially we see this in construction contracts, in infrastructure contracts, large projects. Increasingly, contract disputes get resolved outside of the courts through arbitration. An arbitration practice um, in this country uh, tends to be dominated by some of the big English-speaking law firms, um, and British law firms in particular. So the practical reality often tends to be that if a dispute over a complex construction contract is going to go to arbitration, it's very often likely that both sides are represented by British or American lawyers. Um, both sides may appoint arbitrators who are English-speaking lawyers from common law countries. And it may be that both sides even fly in a barrister from London to argue the case in front of the tribunal when it gets to the final hearings. Both sides wind up presenting their respective cases through lawyers who are steeped in common law expectations, common law methodologies and sensibilities, to arbitrators who are going to view the facts and the law and the legal issue through the lens of their common law glasses. Even if your contract specifies that the laws of Abu Dhabi and the United Arab Emirates are the governing law, and the arbitrators make a valiant effort to apply Abu Dhabi law to the contract, they are going, they cannot help themselves but to read, interpret, and apply UAE law as they understand it, usually through translations into English, some of which may be good and some of which may be not so good, but inevitably through the lens of their common law training and experience. The decisions by the arbitrators are then going to affect the expectations of businessmen, and these expectations will eventually form their way into custom and practice in the UAE market, and we then remind ourselves that the civil code, and I didn't put up on the screen the commercial code, both tell us that custom and practice forms part of UAE law. So one way or another, as the Emirati lawyer said to me a couple of years ago, like it or not, common law lawyers and common law thinking is shaping the legal environment of this country. Like it or not. And then we have the two English language courts that are operating in the nation's two financial free zones. ADGM, the Abu Dhabi Global Market, which is just nearby to here, and DIFC, the Dubai International Financial Center. Both of these are common law courts operating in the English language in common law enclaves carved out of Abu Dhabi and Dubai 
respectively. They operate in an English law framework, meaning that they use English law court rules and procedures and generally operate pretty much the same way as a court in England would operate. And I think I have here um, a list of the judges on the ADGM court, and you can see um, uh, England, England, New Zealand, Australia, England, Scotland, England, England. That's where the ADGM court justices come from. And if we look at the DIFC court, it's slightly more diverse. You have Singapore, UK, three UAE justices, UK, Australia, Malaysia, UK, UK, Singapore. So um, very much common law oriented. We do have the three UAE justices on the DIFC court. Well, originally, both of these courts were set up with a very limited jurisdiction. Uh, ADGM court is much newer Dubai. The DIFC court has been around since I think 2004 or so. Um, set up with a very limited jurisdiction to handle cases only in that free zone only involving companies in the free zone with one another or companies in the free zone with the administrative agencies of that free zone. ADGM court still has that limitation, but Dubai DIFC court does not anymore. Dubai law always provided that DIFC court judgments would be fully enforceable in the rest of Dubai outside the free zone. And conversely, that Dubai court judgments would be fully enforceable inside DIFC. Well, in 2011, the government of Dubai expanded the jurisdiction of the DIFC court by allowing what they call opt-in jurisdiction. You can choose in your contract any future disputes will be handled by the DIFC court. Or if you have an existing dispute, the two parties can sign a paper and say, we both agree to submit our case to DIFC court rather than to Mahakim Dubai or rather than Abu Dhabi court or anywhere else. So it effectively means that in Dubai, you now have two parallel coexisting court systems. One the DIFC court, which you can opt into, you can select it, and if chosen, the DIFC court will hear the case in English, your evidence will be in English, all your submissions will be in English, using common law procedures, but applying whatever governing law you've agreed on. So maybe your contract says all, you know, this contract is governed by the laws of Dubai and the United Arab Emirates, but we agree that any disputes will be heard by DIFC court. And you might want to do that because in your typical a uh, construction dispute, you might have tens of thousands of pages of documents, and anything that goes into the Mahakim Dubai or the Abu Dhabi Judicial Department has to be translated by a certified translator at, you know, if you get a discount, maybe 60 dirhams per page. So you can do the arithmetic, it comes out to be very expensive, and maybe you'd rather handle your case strictly in English, and DIFC court gives you that option. The Dubai courts are now still there, so you have two court systems in parallel. Mahakam Dubai are available as a backstop if the parties didn't choose to go to DIFC court. So you have these two parallel systems. It is a remarkable development. It means that you have a common law court system operating right inside of the UAE. So this in and of itself, this alone tells us that the UAE is not purely a civil law system if it ever was one. But um, as a corollary, it means that whenever the DIFC court is faced with a dispute concerning a contract where the governing law is UAE law, you have English, Australian, Malaysian, Singaporean judges interpreting and ruling on the laws of the UAE there's nothing objectionable about that, but it means that these judges will be reviewing English translations of the laws and will be interpreting the laws as they understand them, which, as I said earlier, will inevitably be affected by their years of training and experience in common law tradition. This, in turn, sets up what is, to me, a really interesting question. Given that the DIFC court and the Dubai courts 
use different methodologies, could this lead to a divergence in jurisprudence as to what Dubai law is or what UAE law is? And I think if my order is right, I have slides to talk about this. So DIFC court being a common law court has a system of binding precedent. The, Dubai, the DIFC court of appeal, which is the top court in DIFC, issues a ruling, it binds the court of first instance, and obviously it applies to people's specific cases. Just like I talked about in the common law tradition, there's that horizontal aspect as well. It binds future courts. It binds the court in future cases where you have similar facts and similar legal issues. Okay. Um, these decisions are enforceable in the courts of Dubai. So I have DIFC court judgment. That court judgment creates a binding precedent. The judgment is published on the DIFC court's website so everybody can read it. They know what it is. It creates a binding precedent. That precedent, as far as DIFC court is concerned, now becomes part of Dubai law. They can, the, the winning party can now take that judgment over to uh, the Arabic side of the street and go to a uh, office in Mahakam Dubai and get that enforced. And in other words, it means collect his money. He can go get the court bailiff to go and knock on the door and say, please pay the judgment. And eventually, if the person refused to pay, they can take a little small hammer and break the door and take stuff out of it. That's what it means to get your judgment enforced. Um, they can um, do that in the Dubai courts. So ultimately, as I said, you have two systems, and I have them with parallel lines here, the DIFC court and the Dubai courts. They're both fully operational. The DIFC court decides cases under Dubai law as it understands it, including prior DIFC court precedents. Whatever it decides becomes a part of DIFC, becomes a part of Dubai law, and then goes and binds it. So it's now an arrow, I guess, would be going back up to DIFC court because it can incorporate that thinking in its future cases. On the other side, we have Mahakim Dubai, which is deciding cases under Dubai law as they understand it, with prior judgments of the Mahkamah Tamiz, the Cassation Court in Dubai, serving as persuasive but not binding authority, their rulings don't create binding precedent. Okay? So we may have two separate courts in the same emirate reaching different views on what a particular article of the civil code means, for example, or what the uh, rule should be in liquidated damages, or um, you know, any number of things. We might get different outcomes. So I have here parallel lines. And to me, what really is the big question is are these lines going to stay parallel? Are they going to converge? Or are they going to diverge? And it's really hard to know. It's a little bit early to tell. They could converge if the two court systems are studying what each other is doing. And particularly here, if the Dubai courts begin sort of relying on some of the precedents set by DAFC court, and vice versa. And I do think, if I go back a few slides, having these three UAE national justices on DAFC court is an important part of that, because these gentlemen, who are all really top, um, top flight minds, came out of the Dubai court system. They obviously have friends there. They obviously are still um, interacting, and they view part of their mission as sort of a transfer of knowledge and technology back from DIFC court into Mahak in Dubai. Um, so that's, that's sort of the optimistic view. Um, it's also quite conceivable that the two lines diverge because you really have, um, you may have 
these courts not paying much attention to what the other courts are doing and ruling and vice versa. So it's, it's kind of hard to know what's going to happen. But um, we, you know, that is something to watch, I think, um, in the next decade or so. That's how it's going to play out. How are we doing for time, by the way? Because I don't have a, I don't know when we started. I, I, I can stop here and take questions if, if it's a good time to do that then. Yeah. Okay, so, <clears throat> I mean, so what we can see, I think, here in the UAE is you have a, a very complex system. You definitely have a hybrid of um, multiple legal systems. You have overt institutions which are uh, applying more than one of the legal systems in, in real actual cases in real time. And I think what we're witnessing in real time is a rapid evolution. And now ADGM court, which really just got up and running a couple of years ago, I think that's going to be another experiment. How does that work? How does it interact with the IFC court? How does it interact with the Arabic language courts in Abu Dhabi? And I think all of this is going to be really exciting to watch over the next, I would say, five to 10 years. And, and, and you know, maybe check back then, and we'll have answers to some of these questions. Yeah, I mean, I think so. And, and Right, OK. And I've got a lapel mic so I can roam around. I can get down off of the podium. OK, so does anybody have questions? You have a question. OK. Um, so I was wondering, is it you can wait for the mic so that everyone can hear you. Hi, thank you for the presentation. I was wondering, as it stands, um, have any DIFC court uh, rulings been used as persuasive authority in Dubai courts? Um, I don't know the answer to that. And, and the reason I don't know the answer to that is, in part, the structure of the way um, the Dubai courts publish their uh, decisions. The Dubai, the Dubai court, the Arabic language court's decisions, they get published kind of on a lag quite later than when they're actually issued. And then they tend to be fairly short. They don't tell you the names of the parties. And sometimes they will be um, very succinct as to what exactly they're citing to. If you are one of the lawyers who are in the case, Sometimes you have a better knowledge of that because you get, a, you get an unredacted form of the judgment. Before the judgments get published by the Dubai courts, and Abu Dhabi Judicial Department does the same thing, they go and scrub out information that would let you figure out who the parties are, and that's based on confidentiality rules. Um, DIFC court is a little different. Everything is all out there for the uh, for everybody to see. So it's it's hard. I, I don't know the answer to that. Is the is the short answer to your question? Thank you. Yes, sir. In the front, the gentleman. Thank you very much, Cat. Very very quick, you know, question. I wonder, what's the specifications of uh, Dubai courts? Does it dom dominate all the uh, rules uh, among the federal, the UAE? Ah, the that's, a, that, 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 that's a really good question. So what, what is the jurisdiction of the Dubai court? So um, interestingly enough, when the UAE was formed uh, in 1971, the Constitution made it possible to create a federal court system. And then you had a federal courts law a couple of years later, and that was opt-in. Each emirate had the choice to join the federal court system or to stay separate. All of the emirates joined except for two. And those two were Dubai and Ras al Khaimah. Dubai and Ras al Khaimah never became part of the federal system. And they always stayed separate, so Dubai the Dubai Mahkamah de Tamiz is the final say on law in the Emirate of Dubai, and they have nothing to do with the federal system. In the other five emirates, 
were part of the federal courts until in 2006, Abu Dhabi sort of stepped back from the federal system and set up Abu Dhabi Judicial Department. So now you really have three emirates with their own independent judiciary, Abu Dhabi, Dubai, and Ras al-Khaimah, and then the other four emirates being part of the federal system. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Something like, um, I don't know, some, a case, I okay. can say it, no? civil case. And that uh, in the newspapers and the media, they say that uh, that uh, nationality has based, I mean, or uh, stand a lawyers from their country to come and defend mm. the, the case, you know. Is that uh, possible here in uh, FEA? Why don't they? Uh, you know, uh, or you could comply, comply with the Dubai uh, courts or Abu Dhabi court, for example. Yeah, so I mean, I think that sometimes we get, particularly, I think, in some very high profile cases, people will bring in an experienced lawyer, maybe from Egypt or um, from another country, and they will be participating in that defense, but typically who can appear in the court and stand up in front of the judge and present oral argument and submit papers with signature has to be a UAE national advocate or um, somebody who is holding an advocacy license. You can get somebody who has special permission for a particular case. Um, to come in, but typically it's going to be a local lawyer who's doing that. A lot of times when you're bringing in lawyers from outside in the Arabic language courts, they are really playing a supporting role. They may even actually lead the team, but they're not out in front in the court. The one out in front in the court is usually the UAE national litigator. In DIFC court, in the English language court, it's a very different story. And so sometimes you do see, well, not sometimes, often, you do see very experienced barristers coming in from London and other parts of the English-speaking world to argue in front of DIFC court. These judges in DIFC court are all top um, uh, judges from the UK, and, and um, you, you like to bring in those very high-powered, high-octane uh, lawyers from London to, if you have a big case there. Yes, sir. Hi, Herb. Uh, Hi. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, my question was more on the speed of how a case is, you know, judged or closed. Like, for example, cases that are raised at DIFC are way quicker than when it comes to Dubai courts. Do you have any idea why this happens? Is it the system? Is it the way the line? Yeah, are? I mean, I think it's 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 partly the system, um, and it's and it and. And what it is about the system, I think, is the lawyers. Um, in a, in the, and the system allows the lawyers, I think, uh, a lot of opportunities to delay things. Um, you have, the, the way it works in the um, Arabic language courts is everything is done on written submissions. And so you go and you give, let's say you're the claimant, you go and you present your memorandum, your submission to the court. And at that hearing, which may last for maybe 90 seconds or two minutes or something, you hand in your submission and the other side says, I need time to review and respond. And the judge says, OK, and they set a new hearing date like two or three weeks in the future. Now, if that hearing is in the month of June, oftentimes that next hearing won't be two weeks in the future, it'll be two or three months in the future because of the summer vacation period. Judges are human beings too. They take vacations. And when some of the judges are on vacation, it means the court is understaffed and they need judges for emergencies, for criminal cases, so they tend to push everything that's not an emergency to the other side of the summer vacation period. So generally, the summer is a slowdown. Ramadan can be another period of slowdown. Plus which defense lawyers learn to sort of game the system a little bit and how to delay things. 
If you are a defense lawyer, every day that you postpone the final outcome is one more day that your client can avoid having to pay the judgment, especially if you think he owes the money um, and his defenses are weak, the more you can delay, the better. Every day that he doesn't have to pay, that money is sitting in his pocket and maybe the claimant will get tired, grow frustrated, die. Anything can happen, right? So you want, it's your incentive to delay. Now in other court systems, in, in, a, in DIFC court, in courts in England, in courts in the US, the judge will not tolerate that. And if you delay too much, you, the lawyer, will wind up with disciplinary action. If you miss a hearing in New York or in London, if the hearing is Thursday at 9 a.m. and you're not there by 9.05, <laughs> you may have that motion decided against you, or the judge may say, explain why you're late, I'm gonna fine you. Okay, here, the judge will, the session is technically open till 1 p.m. Right? So as long as you make an appearance on that day, you can ask for a postponement. You don't get much discipline. The, 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 the rules are there, but the judges tend not to be too harsh on the lawyers. They don't want a case to be won or lost on what we might call in the West a technicality. Part of it, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm making light of it and I'm being sort of facetious and it's very frustrating if you are a party in a court case or if you're a lawyer on the wrong side of that. But I think there's a very real reason for that, which is that I think that when we look at some of the Islamic law values about fairness and justice, I think the judges don't want to feel that they're shutting the door to a defendant who has a defense to make. They want to give him the chance to present his case. And if he's not ready today, give him a postponement. Now the Dubai courts are much better than they used to be. So are the Abu Dhabi courts. You know, now in the year 2017, courts, the cases do move along. They're more slow than maybe we'd like them to be, but they're way better than when I first got here. So um, I, some of the people are uh, friends with my former boss who brought me here in 1992. Um, the first thing that my boss gave me to do was work on a particular uh, case in the Abu Dhabi courts. I arrived in 1992. The case was, had been filed in 1986 and it was still at the court of first instance level. And it took another six or eight years before it was finally resolved. It's better than that nowadays. It's much, much better than that. But it's, you know, it's still slower than we'd like. Anybody else? Somebody in the back, I think, in, all the way in the back, a lady there has, and then the gentleman behind her. I think you, yeah. No, way, way back behind you, the lady in the, in the, yeah, you, with the glasses, all the way, yeah, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, hi, I just had a question. Um, for judges and lawyers, how complicated is it to work here? As in, or like study, do you have to study one thing and then practice another? Or like, what if you only study Sharia law? Do you just practice that? Or, you know, how complicated is it for a lawyer or a judge to actually um, work here? Well, it depends if you want to be a good one or not. Um, <laughs> um, you know, there, there, there are there are minimum there are surely minimum qualifications, right? So you can come out of let's say UAE University or you know whichever university is offering. You have to to be licensed as an advocate. You have to study Sharia in addition to whatever else is in the law curriculum. Um, is that enough? Well, it depends what you want to do. Um, a lot of people will want to get their start working in the public prosecution as, um, you know, uh, in, pr prosecuting criminal cases. And that gives you great experience with how the court works and how, um, you know, how, how procedures work and, and drafting and all that kind of stuff. But if you want to be eventually in private practice, I know some people, they graduate from law school and they say, okay, now I'm a UAE national, I'm an advocate, I've got my... Uh, Ministry of Justice registration, I'm gonna open my own office. Well, you can do that, but what kind of training do you really have in dealing with clients? Because I think a lot of the problem is 
understanding what clients want and how to give it to them. And so you don't know who's going to walk into your office. So you could be the foremost expert in Sharia, and then somebody walks into your office and they have a construction claim. Or you know they've bought a villa off plan and the developer never delivered, and you know they want to get their money back. So you kind of need to be a little bit of a generalist. If you go work for a big law firm, the big law firm may say, "Okay, we have an opening for a construction lawyer. We have an opening for somebody who knows banking or Islamic finance or whatever." But if you're going to be on your own, you really need to know a little bit about everything, or at least be prepared to learn about it on the fly. Um, I think there was like all, yeah, just behind the lady, and then all down the row in front of her, people were asking questions. Uh, okay, my you question tell is, me. my question is relating to execution of DFC court order. Mm. In one of the slide, you mentioned that it can be executed through Dubai court, enforced through Dubai court. Mm -hmm. So, uh, can it be not be directly executed, or whether it can be executed through other courts, like in Abu Dhabi court or any other Emirates? So. Um, Let's answer your first question, your third question, and your second question in that sequence. Your first question was, can you enforce it directly? You, so the DIFC court order is directly enforceable inside of DIFC. So if your debtor has assets in the DIFC, you don't need to go to any other court. They can directly order it to pay. Okay? The, if you need to basically attach a bank account or get assets that are located in the Emirate of Dubai, that's when you need to go through Mahakam Dubai, the, the Dubai courts, to get that execution order. If you want to execute in another Emirate, so it depends which one. Um, this is a complicated question. So some of the Emirates court systems have sort of agreements or protocols signed with DIFC court. Russell Khaimah is one of them. So I'd say you probably have a decent chance in Russell Khaimah. Abu Dhabi is always a little bit of a harder question of whether you can do that directly or whether you need to go and get a Dubai court order first and then take the Dubai order and that, is, that should be enforceable under the inter-emirate judicial cooperation law. So um, I think that Abu Dhabi is a little bit of a tougher nut to crack, but um, you know, it should be doable in, in a multi-step process. Um, one more, and this lady was, this lady right here with her hand up now, yeah, she's been waiting very patiently. Thank you, thank, thank you. Uh, I just want to ask, uh, if uh, someone committed a crime, can choose a car, uh, the, the court uh, to, no, he cannot. So, uh, in which court do, do he must go? Um, that's where the crime was committed. So, um, yeah, all what I've been talking about, about choosing courts and whatever, this is in contracts, in commercial and civil contracts. Um, if you've committed a crime, uh, you are in the jurisdiction of the court where that crime was committed. Uh, so uh, it isn't uh, from uh, uh, the crime law, and uh, I assume that it isn't uh, uh, from and the family law, perhaps, because uh, uh, the, if someone wants to choose between the two uh, courts, uh, it's uh, only for business disputes, not for family disputes or crimes, isn't it? Um, not for crimes. Um, for family disputes? For family disputes, um, I, I want to step carefully because I don't want to give you the wrong answer and I'm not, um, I'm not a Sharia trained lawyer. I think that in theory there's, that you can't select it by agreement, but families may have members in different places and depending on where family members are or assets like houses and bank accounts and, and things like that that are part of the family dispute or where children are or whatever, all of that may affect whether it's Abu Dhabi or Dubai or Sharjah or whatnot. Um, I, I really don't know what those rules are, but um, you can't 
voluntarily choose, but sometimes there may be more than one correct answer as to which court has jurisdiction. So what I want to, as the last question, is that uh, the common law forms mostly the business uh, disputes, not the family disputes, not uh, the crime law, and not the way that it is functioning the public uh, offices and uh, the ministers, and et cetera. I mean, the procedural. Uh, well, that, that, that's correct, except for one thing, which is I would guess if you went around and you polled people here who were British or American or Australian or whatnot, they may well have, um, they may well have wills that are intended to distribute assets outside of the UAE or in a manner that's different from uh, Islamic inheritance law. And some of those get registered at DIFC. So I, I, that is another complicated area of law. But when you're talking about expats with assets here and assets overseas, sometimes there's at least an effort. I don't know how well that works. I don't really know whether those things are enforceable or not, but let's, but, but there is some aspect of it there, but I think mostly what you said is correct, mostly. Thank you, thank you. You're welcome. Well, thanks Philip for inviting me and thank all of you.